Tonight, uh, the announced topic is an overview of, I believe that was announced, wasn't it? An overview of uh, Darwinism and its history. I am going to give you a very quick run-through of uh, history from the ancient world to the present (laughs) uh, to explain where uh, Darwinian evolution fits in. And I'm going to start not with Darwin, but several centuries before Christ with the uh, pre-Socratic Greek philosopher Epicurus. The word Epicurean is still used. Uh, Epicurus uh, taught uh, that the goal of a rational life was to be free of anxiety, have no worries. And the way to get uh, worry-free was to get rid of the notion that there are gods or a god who interfere in our lives and especially who judge us after death. Death must be the end of everything, so we don't have to worry about what happens afterwards. Uh, In life, we just want to uh, live for pleasure, having as much pleasure as is consistent with good health. And that was the philosophy. And the object of science at Epicurus was to persuade the people that they don't have to worry about the gods. These were in pagan times, of course. Well, now, moving forward from Epicurus, uh, we come at just about the time of Christ to Lucretius, a great Roman poet who wrote a long poem on the nature of things, which actually outlined an evolutionary theory. He was the interpreter of Epicurus to the Latin speaking world, and uh, Lucretius explained how to carry out the scientific program of Epicurus, uh, you you should understand that living things were not created by God or by the pagan gods. They evolved as a result of chance combinations of atoms. Epicurus and Lucretius agreed that the world was made up of um, infinitesimally small hard objects called atoms which came together to form everything. And so the atoms came together into certain odd shapes, and some of these became living and were able to reproduce their kind. And the ones which were better fitted at living and reproducing were the ones that survived and produced offspring. You you can see this is the basic elements of the Darwinian theory right there in ancient times in Latin. Lucretius's masterpiece was virtually unknown for a thousand years uh, at Uh, uh, after the fall of Rome, because it was suppressed by the Christians in authority. It was rediscovered in the Renaissance, the revival of classical learning uh, in the 1400s, and uh, became uh, famous among the intellectuals of the time. Uh, So this was the revival of this philosophy, and it was very important in Uh, leading to the modern ways of thinking. It was a a way of escaping from the authority of the church and of the religion, as uh, many thinkers were interested in doing. Then following this uh, period, we began to get the rise of modern science with astronomy, Galileo, Newton, and so on, who aspired to explain uh, what we see in the heavens on the basis of uh, unbroken natural laws with no need for divine action. See, God didn't have to have anything to do with it. Uh, the laws uh, kept everything running perfectly satisfactory. And as this view of science took hold, a corresponding religious philosophy developed called deism, or religious rationalism. See, God was still retained because he was necessary to start things off and to create life. Uh, but pretty much in between, the world ran uh, itself without the need for God to take notice of it. And so we have the religious rationalism of founders of America, like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, uh, coming out of this view of uh, science. But it was much harder to extend this impersonal, universe-runs-itself uh, view uh, to the history of life. Nobody knew how Life could be explained on the basis of natural laws. So we fast forward to the 19th century. Uh, We have uh, first uh, the growth of a uniformitarian geology, which said, well, 
Uh, contrary to what the Bible seems to say, the earth is very old, and all of the natural, feces, uh, all of the natural features of the planet, from mountains uh, to canyons, everything, can be explained on the basis of the slow but steady operation of the forces we see uh, in, in action today, like the rainstorm we've just been having here, <laughs> and uh, erosion of uh, and, and just those slow, steady processes. Uh, and that, that explained the geological features. Now, it seemed quite a logical next step to extend this uniformitarian theory of the earth uh, to the living world. And that was what remained to, to be done. The uniformitarian geology was made orthodoxy in British science by a man named Charles Lyell, who was a lawyer, actually. And amateur geologists, there, there weren't any professional scientists in the modern sense in those days. They were all amateurs, including Darwin. Um, Darwin read Lyell, was a kind of disciple of that, uh, and he went on this round-the-world voyage and did a lot of collecting of specimens and demonstrating of, uh, of features of uh, organisms. Uh, and then in 1859, published his theory of biological evolution. This was the extension to biology of the principle that everything in the world, everything in nature operates on the basis of some combination of natural laws and chance. Same as Lucretius. But brought up to date and then illustrated with a wealth of detail because Darwin was a very dedicated first-rate collector and dissector of uh, uh, plants and especially animal specimens. So if you read uh, his masterpiece, The Origin of Species, it definitely gives the impression that this evolutionary chance and natural law approach has been demonstrated by scientific evidence. Now, uh, for some years after Darwin's time, uh, uh, the, the, the world of science uh, did not place much faith in his theory that evolution operates by this process of random variations and natural selection. The natural selection is important. They weren't sure of that. But they thought that things had somehow all evolved and by a natural process. That was what was taken from Darwin originally. It was just the basic principle that things evolved by a natural process, and especially that human beings evolved from apes. Uh, the, the, the Descent of Man, Darwin's second masterpiece. Now, uh, the, the, that, that was the state of things uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. The scientific world was completely convinced. And there was really no struggle. Uh, the theory of evolution, the basic idea, took the world by storm. Professors who didn't adopt it found that they were instant has -beens. Fashion passed them by. Uh, but natural selection was largely ignored at this time. So now we come to 1925. It's a, it's a quick ride through history. <laughs> now, uh, uh, in, uh, 19, in that year, there was a, uh, a small organization just starting out uh, called the American Civil Liberties Union, which... Uh, as his first cases was protecting dissenters and pacifists and the like uh, who had been persecuted during World War I. The ACLU was looking for something to, to put it into the big time and so solicit funds. So they advertised. They, they saw that William Jennings Bryan, the three-time Democratic presidential candidate, who was on a crusade against evolution. He was saying that it denied the Bible, it denied the authority of God, and it shouldn't be taught in the schools. And he got the state of uh, Tennessee to uh, pass a law uh, against uh, teaching evolution in the public schools of the state. The, the, uh, the, uh, the, there was a general agreement it's, uh, between the governor and the legislature that they were doing this as a symbolic measure and it was never going to be enforced. And in fact, the, the, the school authorities in Tennessee had adopted a, a biology textbook called Civic Biology, which uh, taught uh, evolution. So it was all over nothing. Uh, but the ACLU saw an opportunity. They advertised for a teacher who was willing to challenge the law. And uh, some uh, town fathers in a town called Dayton, Tennessee, which Kathy and I are going to visit next month, 
Uh, the town fathers decided this was an opportunity to put the town on the map and draw a lot of tourist business to the town. So they took up the ACLU challenge and s- agreed to set up this trial. A physical education teacher who had once a substitute taught in biology agreed to say that he had taught evolution, although he didn't remember whether he had or not. Uh, <laughs> But they kept him off the stand so he wouldn't be asked. Uh, uh, and, and so they went ahead with this show trial. Now, it was all just a publicity stunt. Nobody was put in jail. Nobody was being persecuted or in danger of losing their, their job. That was what it was about. It got out of hand when two very famous lawyers, William Jennings Bryan himself and Clarence Darrow, fresh from the Loeb Leopold murder case in Chicago, volunteered to do the prosecution of the defense, respectively. And it ended in this big show. Now, that trial has gone down in Darwinist mythology as a great story of persecution, which, of course, is told in the play and movie Inherit the Wind, uh, uh, which is still shown in the public schools often as a true history showing how the evil religious people, it, it, it portrays the Christian ministers of the town as basically being like the Ku Klux Klan, out to work whatever evil and violence they can. They even try to break up the romance between the teacher and the pretty girl, and you can't get lower than that. Uh, and, uh, so, so this has been an enormous part of the Darwinian emotional and propaganda ar- arsenal. Uh, I, I, I hope everybody is familiar with Inherit the Wind. They must have seen it somewhere. It's been around so much. The true story of the Scopes trial uh, and how it differs from Inherit the Wind, is told in Chapter 2 of my book, uh, Defeating Darwinism by Opening Minds. It's on sale out there. And you can also get, if you go to the public television, the PBS website, um, a, uh, a videotape of their American Experience series. The title of it is Monkey Trial, about the Scopes Trial, which tells the true story. I participated in that uh, at PBS program. Uh, uh, in, in my uh, guise as a a uh, criminal law expert. <laughs> uh, so it's a really excellent program with great uh, uh, historical uh, uh, value. It, it tells the true story. And, it, uh, and I think it's really important that people learn the to, uh, true story because it's such a wonderful example of how propaganda has been used uh, to, uh, uh, to sell this myth of the truth-seeking scientists persecuted by the evil Christians. Uh, and and uh, uh, to uh, to get public uh, support for uh, the theory. Well, now uh, continuing our uh, rapid fire uh, jaunt through uh, history, we we go from 1925 to 1959. Uh, when I was a 19-year-old college student, this was the Centennial year, the 100th anniversary of the publication of Darwin's masterpiece uh, on the origin of species. So, uh, the scientists, the evolutionary scientists of the world decided that they wanted to hold a a great celebration. The University of Chicago sponsored it. It was held in Chicago on Thanksgiving Day weekend of 1959. The evolutionary scientists came from all over the world to announce that uh, now, a hundred years after the publication of his masterpiece, Darwin's theory had become absolutely triumphant in the scientific world and also in the culture and in religion, even. The keynote speaker at the Chicago Centennial was uh, Sir Julian Huxley, the grandson of Thomas Henry Huxley, the... uh, who, who, who was Darwin's bulldog in the initial debates. Darwin was a man who was always sick and was very shy. So uh, Huxley took the kind of role that I take, actually, today, of, of being the public voice of uh, uh, the, 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 the issue and uh, uh, persuading uh, uh, the world uh, that the theory was uh, uh, true. Uh, uh, Julian Huxley was a, uh, uh, a founder of the a uh, modern version of Darwin's theory called the Neo-Darwinian Synthesis, which put together uh, evidence of genetics and uh, of all scientific disciplines, fossil studies and uh, uh, botany, everything, uh, to make a Neo-Darwinian Synthesis, a new version of the theory that would be suitable for the mid-20th century and that uh, could uh, 
uh, cover up any defects in the original theory. So, so Julian Huxley was the keynote speaker at Chicago, and he gave uh, from the uh, pulpit of the Rockefeller Chapel, in the University Chapel, uh, this lecture on how now we no longer needed to imagine an, uh, a father figure in the sky to account for our creation. So he put it on explicitly religious grounds that uh, God was dead. And that now we would have to explain everything in terms of scientific principles and everything about uh, how, how we come into existence and uh, how humans happen to be here uh, uh, on, on the basis of Darwin's theory. Now, this was a great triumphal uh, moment. It was publicized through uh, the country with the newspapers, the radio, uh, television was just starting out then. <laughs> I, was, it became, I was already in, in, in place. Uh, so that it was announced that now we were all to believe in Darwinism. So this was the, the, the great moment at which Darwinism took control of American culture. Before that, it had been something that people talked about in the universities, but it had not had an enormous impact at the popular level. Uh, there was a lot of resistance. So that was supposed to put an end to that. And the Darwinists confidently predicted that all resistance to the theory would uh, uh, fade away uh, in, in rapid order after this uh, triumph. Now, uh, I want to go through the 1950s and tell you what happened during those days that brought us to where we are today. See, that, that triumph. Now, in the first place, the triumphal celebration in 1959 was made possible by the fact that the Darwinists had at last discovered, after many years of, of looking unsuccessfully, they had at last discovered an example of natural selection doing something in the wild. Now, Darwin based his whole theory on the creative power of natural selection to, to do all of this evolution, but he had no examples that natural selection had ever done anything in the wild. What he had to rely on was an analogy of, of, of domestic animal breeding. Dog breeding, breeding for the woolliest sheep. Farmers do this, of course. Uh, and we, we get these different breeds of dogs. And he said, well, that's what evolution is like. It does that in the wild. In natural selection, uh, the principle that some things are much better at reproducing and surviving than others, uh, selects the most fit creatures. And so everything gets more fit all the time. And that's how you go from uh, microbial characters up to complex living things and eventually to human beings. So, but he had only this analogy to artificial selection, selective breeding. Now, that isn't a very good analogy because it is, of course, an intelligently guided process that people do. You have to have the people to do it. It doesn't have any, it isn't what's going on in the natural world. And, and even with people guiding it, um, it only produces variations within a biological species. Uh, a biological species is usually defined for this purpose as a as a as a an isolated breeding group. So you're in the same species if you can breed and produce viable offspring with the other members of that species. The species is the circle of those who can breed together. Uh, uh, now all de dogs are of one species because they're biologically interfertile, so, and 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 you you, you can breed them. Uh, uh, the, the, the different breeds together. They're not different species. They, they, they uh, 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 breed. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, so uh, the, the artificial selection uh, does not show you how to take a, a dog and, and change it into a camel. So, uh, or or uh, much less a, a bird or, or, whatever, or vice versa. You, you don't get changes in kind, but just the variations within the species. Uh, 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 but um, uh, in, in 1959, uh, uh, a scientist published an article in Scientific American uh, titled Darwin's Missing Evidence. And Darwin's Missing Evidence was the story of the peppered moth. Well, there is a species of moth in the Midlands of England uh, which is predominantly light colored, a sort of a tan, light colored. Um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, its natural state, or what was at one time. Um, and uh, these light-colored uh, uh, moths, uh, 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 during the 19th century, dark-colored, black versions of the same species began to appear uh, throughout the, the forests of England. And by the end of the 19th century, the black uh, variety had out-reproduced the white variety, the light-colored variety, 
And so the, the species was predominantly dark colored. Now, uh, how did this happen? Well, uh, uh, the uh, biologists theorized that uh, they had, uh, that the light colored moths had dominated in the population until the mid 19th century because uh, the tree trunks on which the moths rest are light colored. And so the light-colored moths were well camouflaged against this background. The birds couldn't see them to eat them. They did see the dark-colored moths, and they ate them. So they, there weren't very many dark-colored moths. Then the trees got darkened by industrial smoke during the Industrial Revolution. The dark-colored moths were better camouflaged. The light-colored moths stood out. They got eaten by the birds. Not so many light-colored moths. And then in the mid-20th century, air pollution laws cleaned up the trees and... Uh, 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 the light-colored moths had a comeback and became predominant. And this was the story of Darwin's missing evidence. Uh, a, uh, a biologist named Kettlewell had gone uh, uh, to investigate all of this and had collected many moths. And uh, as, as his collections and his statistics seemed to uh, back up this story of uh, natural selection by differential bird predation eating. Uh, and this gave the Darwinists uh, the, the uh, confidence to say, now we have demonstrated that Darwin's theory works in the wild, not just in uh, human-directed uh, uh, artificial uh, selection. That's uh, how it works. Now, uh, it will immediately have occurred to you that uh, uh, even taking this story at face value, it uh, does not tell you anything at all about how you get moths, uh, trees, birds, and scientific observers in the first place. All it tells you about is, is that if, if, if you have a, a moth population, there is some explanation about how the predominant coloring of the individual, in the, in the pop, of the population, the coloring might, might change over uh, time. Now, no moths, no individual moths changed color during this period. It's just that some of the time you had more light colored moths and at other times you had more dark colored moths. Uh, and there was no uh, permanent change even of this kind. It was light to dark and, and, and back again. Uh, over the century, the, the color was uh, uh, fundamentally stable. It didn't change. There was just a back and forth variation. Yet, uh, confidence in the theory was so great that uh, the scientists took this as conclusive proof that natural selection could do everything that was advertised for it. And this was the basis of their triumphal uh, feeling. Now, uh, Let's go back a few years to 1952. Uh, in that year, also at the University of Chicago, a chemistry graduate student named Stanley Miller uh, uh, decided to test a theory about how life had first begun, which would supplement Darwin's theory of how life evolved to its present state of complexity once it was already in existence. So how do you get the first step? How do you get life started in the first place? And the theory was... That, it, that, that the early Earth had an atmosphere with no oxygen in it, chemicals like hydrogen, nitrogen, and methane. And if you made a mixture of these gases and put them in some chemical apparatus and shot bolts of electricity, simulating lightning through this mixture, you would get some chemicals in the bottom of the apparatus uh, called amino acids. And Miller did. He managed to get some amino acids. And that the scientific world took this as proof that this was showed how life originated. All you needed was the right gases and bolts of lightning going through it. And voila, you get amino acids. Amino acids are important chemical constituents of proteins. Proteins are the basic building blocks of life. And uh, here you have it. 1952. In 1953, uh, other scientists named Francis Crick and James Watson discovered the structure of the DNA molecule, the molecule of heredity. Up until this time, the gene, the fundamental unit of heredity, the thing that is supposed to be inherited in the evolutionary uh, process, was simply a hypothetical entity. Nobody had ever seen a gene. Well, see, now they had a molecule, and you could, you could say that what a gene is, it's a, it's a stretch of DNA. See, so we now have a physical embodiment of the gene, uh, and that also greatly contributed to the triumphal uh, feeling in 1959. And then finally, in 1957, the Soviet Union sent up the first space satellite, unmanned Sputnik, 
I remember it. I was a freshman in college at the time, all the excitement, which sent the American scientific establishment and national defense establishment into a panic. The communists are taking over space, and they'll rule the universe if we don't do something about it. And so we have to greatly emphasize science and science education in our culture. Teach everybody to think like scientists. This is necessary so that we can uh, have many more professional scientists, of course, who will invent spaceships and things. But more than that, we have to have a population of people who, whether they ever become scientists or not, believe in science and will fund it very generously. So they have to be taught to think like scientists and to respect the science. And that means that they have to be uh, taught to think like Darwinists because the scientific elite said this is a crucial element of thinking like a scientist is that you believe that evolution did all the creating and God had nothing to do with it, that you trust to science to tell you the creation story. So that is when the federal government went into textbook preparation in a big way and into directing what is taught in the schools all around the country and to make sure that evolution was presented in a convincing a way. So when I get through 1959 and the centennial year and the cultural triumph of uh, Darwinism, uh, to take the story just one little step further, in 1962, the Supreme Court of the United States decided that uh, prayers in the public schools the constitutionality of which had never been doubted up to that moment, had now become unconstitutional. And now school prayer, uh, official prescribed prayers you know, at the start of the day, were unconstitutional. The prayer in question, by the way, was not from the Bible Belt. It was a, uh, a, a prayer that was prescribed by the educational authorities in New York State as a means of bringing Christians and Jews together in acknowledgement of... Uh, that they all believed in a common God. No Jesus in it, of course. Uh, but just we acknowledge our dependence on, on, on our creator, on God. Uh, and uh, the Supreme Court held this unconstitutional for use in the public schools. Now, this wasn't because the Constitution had been amended, I assure you. It was a change in intellectual fashion. That it was understood that once Darwinism had become official policy and the official creed of the United States, that its necessary implication was that God was imaginary. That, that God was the subject of religious belief, not fact. So you don't teach about God in the public schools or acknowledge God's existence in the public schools. In the public schools, you talk about knowledge, not subjective beliefs. There may be people who believe in uh, you know, fairies or leprechauns or Zeus or God. Uh, but this is just private religious belief and it has no standing in the public arena where, and particularly in the public schools, where you teach what really happened. Uh, and, and, and so this, uh, uh, we have, uh, as a logical development of the new intellectual fashion, the school prayer decision of 1962. Uh, and uh, subsequently, uh, as another logical development, the sexual revolution, change in the marriage and divorce laws to make divorce uh, easily obtainable and with no stigma, and so on to abortion and beyond. And, uh, each of these things uh, 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 happens. Now, if we want go back to that decade of the 1950s and the final uh, minutes of uh, the lecture part of uh, the evening, uh, I want to go back to the items that I mentioned that occurred in the 1950s. First, 1959, Darwin's missing evidence, the peppered moth story. Now, uh, most of the time when I've been lecturing, I have taken the peppered moth story at face value. I don't like to distract people by... Uh, Picking away at uh, items that are not essential. And the important thing to understand about the peppered moth story is, as I said, it doesn't tell you anything about how you got moths or anything else in the first place. Uh, it's just this back and forth uh, 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 change in the moth uh, population uh, uh, and not at the, the production of anything new uh, or more complex. Uh, it has since become known, however, something that's really too good to pass up. That subsequent studies uh, have shown that this species of moth, these moths, do not rest on tree trunks anyway. <laughs> they're nocturnal. They fly at night, and during the day, they're up in the branches. 
where they're out of sight. They're not on the tree trunks. Now, uh, when, when uh, I say that, there are often people who say, well, now, now I, I've suspected there's something wrong with you, Johnson, and now I know it. Uh, because I've taken a biology course, and, and in our biology textbook, there are photographs of the moths on tree trunks, the light moth, uh, and then the dark moth, and depending on the color of the trunk, the, one or the other is more visible, and there's the bird hungrily eyeing the moth. It's about to eat the most visible one. So we know that that's true. We've, we've seen pictures of it. Uh, well, uh, in fact, those photographs were staged. You see, what, you, you, what they did is they take the moths during the day when they're torpid, and they're motionless, and they just stick them on the trunks, and somebody gluing or pinning them there if necessary, although they'll just stay there if you put them on a log, uh, uh, and uh, then they photograph them. So the, the, the photographs are fraudulent, and the whole story is, is fictitious. Uh, even in its own right, uh, as I say, but it wouldn't matter much even if uh, it were a true story of how the moths uh, behave. So this is one of the examples in which uh, the evidence that was relied on as of 1959 has come to seem very dubious. Uh, attempts are made all over the country to get those photographs out of the textbooks and to get the scientific elite to acknowledge that this evidence is not valid. But you see, it's too important for them to give up on it. It's too important. And... Uh, so the, uh, the publishers of the textbooks backed by the science organization stonewall. And they insist that it's valiant and anyhow. And some, somehow it illustrates something that is important and it should continue to be in the books because they can't afford to remove them. People would, would notice it would be too humiliating a report, a, a retreat to allow. Uh, then uh, going back to 1952, remember the Stanley Miller experiment? The gases thought to represent the early Earth? Uh, an electric, uh, well, and nowadays, geologists do not think that that is the mixture of gases that was present on the early Earth. That's completely out of date. Wrong mixture. Uh, and uh, now, now, once again, however, the much more important thing about the experiment is that it is well understood now uh, that uh, uh, any, uh, e even the simplest uh, living things, a single-celled bacterium, for example, are extraordinarily uh, complex. Uh, uh, this has been uh, shown in, in many uh, uh, writings, including uh, especially the uh, book Darwin's Black Box by my biochemist uh, colleague uh, Michael Behe, professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, that a cell which Darwin and other scientists of his time thought was just a, a kind of a blob of jello or jelly-like substance that you can easily see coming together from chemicals. Uh, that's what they thought it was. But the cell is a miniature chemical factory of extraordinary complexity that, that, that makes a spaceship or a supercomputer look rather low tech in comparison. So the idea that all you need to do is to have a certain number of chemicals and get some amino acids and then life emerges uh, uh, spontaneously is completely fallacious and no merit to it at all. And uh, prebiotic evolution or chemical evolution of the first life forms is a field that's completely stagnant and uh, all respectable scientists have pretty much given up on it. It must have happened somehow, they say, but we don't have any idea how. Well, we'll start with living things already reproducing and uh, go on from there. So, so, so the, the Miller experiment has fallen. Uh, and the Watson-Crick, uh, the DNA uh, experiment also, you see, uh, it provided, it's true, a physical embodiment of the gene. Uh, but the important thing about DNA is not the physical element, not the chemis chemicals that go in to, to make up this molecule. Uh, DNA is an extremely complex molecule that has uh, uh, an arrangement of chemical letters They're called uh, nucleotides by biochemists that are uh, uh, arranged in a certain way that they provide uh, the information of which the cell needs to synthesize and put together uh, uh, proteins. So they're, they're an analogous to a kind of an instruction manual or textbook that specifies uh, what needs to be done in the cell in order to make uh, the, the, the proteins. So the important thing um, is not the chemicals, but the arrangement of the chemical letters. It's exactly the same thing as with uh, 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 a, a book. You can take a glorious book like the Bible or the plays of Shakespeare or something more humble like one of my books or uh, <laughs> the Seattle uh, 
a telephone directory. It doesn't matter what you pick. But any book is, is, is full of information. And what conveys the information is not the nature of the chemical bonds between the ink and the paper. See, if that were the case, then all books would be the same. There wouldn't be any difference between one or another. The ink and the paper chemistry is the same. It's the arrangement of the letters, which is uh, the work of the creative intelligence. Uh, uh, so uh, so uh, the problem that the DNA uh, model uh, presents us with is where does the information come? It sets the arrangement of the uh, letters. Uh, 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 it does not come from random mutations or variations or random mutations. And, and you can see that illustrated if you just take a, 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 a cup full of Scrabble letters and spill them out on the table and see whether you get a meaningful sentence. Okay. If uh, they spell out uh, uh, to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> whether it is better, nobler in the mind to suffer, <laughs> etc. cetera, uh, then, then you've got a miracle. Uh, and it can easily be shown by mathematical analysis that uh, the, the, to get any, any meaningful English sentence out of that kind of process of random arrangement of letters, uh, uh, it takes a number of tries and the average, uh, you know, which, which takes you far, far, far lo- will take you far longer than the estimated age of the universe. Okay. So, so we're not getting the, uh, the information out of chance arrangements and we're also not getting it out of repeating physical law. I'd like to illustrate. Here's how you get a book out of law-like action. Just program your word processor with the instructions. Uh, print out the word law, L-A-W, uh, until a printer runs out of paper. Say, well, you get a book out of that. You can get hundreds of pages. <laughs> but it's a very boring book. <laughs> It's only one word repeated endlessly, and it's never going to get more interesting (laughs) because the same law that gives you the order that you do get, the repetitious use of that combination of three letters, ensures that you never get anything else. Uh, And and so you cannot explain the kind of information that you have in a book of any kind uh, uh, on the basis of either random variations, uh, or repeatable law-like processes, or some combination of the two. And so this brings us up to the intelligent design movement, uh, and uh, my my book, uh, Darwin on Trial, in 1991, uh, which started that, and the uh, critique of uh, uh, evolutionary theory, not on the ground that it um, uh, contradicts the Bible. uh, that I, I've skipped over the creation science movement that brought a, create, a critique on that basis in the 1960s, immediately after the 1959 centennial. And uh, 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 you can ask about that if you want to, but I'll you know, sort of go, go, go straight forward to the, the, the critique, which is taking the uh, most at the center stage now and has the scientific elite, the mandarins, I call them, most worried. Which is to say that never mind the you know the Bible that's another subject we can talk about you know that, that that anyone can talk about but quite without regard to that simply on scientific terms simply on the basis of the scientific reasoning uh, the effort to explain the origin of life uh, and its growth to its present uh, complexity to explain in a word the information the the, the software of life the the, the, the instructions, the stuff that makes this complex thing we call a body operate in marvelous harmony with all of its organs and trillions of cells. The, the information content of life, the instructions, is totally unexplained by evolutionary science. The attempt to explain it has been a complete failure. Uh, and, uh, uh, it, it, and now it has become necessary for uh, the uh, Darwinists to rely on their control over the media, their control over the educational system. In short, their authoritarian power to shut down freedom of thought in order to keep this system uh, in, in place as the dominant uh, ideology uh, of our uh, culture. And th- th- this creates a lot of difficulty for them, and that's why they tend to be very bad-tempered these days and uh, hard to get along with because they feel 
very insecure in their hold on the great power and wealth that they have as a basis of the uh, theory. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, 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 they, they dread the possibility of an open debate where the rules do not require that their theory be the only one considered uh, or that uh, uh, the creator be kept uh, forcibly out of the picture. So that is a, 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 an overview uh, of the uh, status of uh, 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 of the of the history and development of Darwinism up to its uh, 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 present uh, uh, time, uh, and we'll be going further into the implications of that in the other two lectures. And in the question period, 